Open the podcast bay door as hell. This is episode six of Welcome to Geek Town. I'm your host, Kurt Onstead. I've been a proud geek all my life, being into role-playing games, board games, sci-fi, fantasy, and especially superheroes and comics. And I want to help others join me in those pursuits. But I found that sometimes people can get overwhelmed or feel left out because they don't already have what some consider the requisite knowledge to be considered a fan. And that's where Welcome to Geek Town comes in. Here you can ask your questions without feeling like a gatekeeper is calling you out for not being yet fully versed in every aspect of your new interest. Before we get started, I wanted to thank James Baker of the Pop Cult Net podcast for having me on last week to discuss Solo, a Star Wars story with him. I had a fun time and recommend everyone go check that out. This week's question comes to us from Joshua C. He asked at the Facebook page, I'd be interested in your take on the differences between Marvel and DC, and why it's an either-or scenario for so many. Thanks for writing in, Joshua. It's an interesting question, because if you look at other forms of entertainment, it's rare that we really get attached to the company behind it in the way that some people are specifically fans of Marvel or DC. For instance, it's pretty uncommon to hear someone say, I only watch ABC shows. I refuse to watch NBC. Or, why would anyone buy Sony music records? I'm a Universal Music Group zombie. With most forms of entertainment, like movies, TV, and music, it's more about the individual creators than it is about the company behind it. Disney perhaps being a rare exception to that rule. So what makes the comic book industry different? Well, let's go back in time some to look at the origin of the two companies and how their rivalry started. One caveat before I get into my answer for Joshua's question. I read both Marvel and DC Comics, as well as other publishers. However, historically, my preferences have leaned towards Marvel. I will do everything I can to present this as evenly as possible and not let my own personal bias show through, but I wanted to be honest about my point of view. Also, comparing these two companies, I'm going to speak in generalities. I know there are exceptions that prove the rule on both sides, but to show the contrast between Marvel and DC, I may have to paint with a broad brush. While I do want to hear more from you listeners out there, I don't need a list of every counterexample. If you disagree with my overall point, please let me know, but back it up with more than just a couple of exceptions. Now, with that out of the way, let's get started. As I mentioned way back in the inaugural episode, DC basically started the superhero genre as we recognize it today, with the publication of Superman's first appearance in Action Comics No. 1 back in 1938 although at the time they were known as National Comics. Other companies followed suit, including Timely Comics, which published Captain America, and a little book called Marvel Mystery Comics, featuring characters like Namor the Submariner and the Human Torch. These Timely characters and others fell by the wayside in the late 40s and into the 50s, and timely shifted its attention towards westerns, romance, and horror comics. At the same time, many of Nationals, now DC's, characters also stopped being published as they diversified into other genres, with only a few superhero holdouts, including Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. When superheroes came back into fashion in the early 60s, DC again started the trend with the Silver Age Flash in Showcase No. 4, 
Again, please check out the first episode of this podcast if you want some more detail about DC's history. After the appearance of the Justice League, timely editor-in-chief Martin Goodman asked one of his writers to come up with their own company's super team. That writer was just about ready to quit the comic book business altogether, but his wife convinced him that, since he was leaving anyways, he should try writing the kind of book he wanted to read. That writer was Stan Lee, and the book that he ended up writing was Fantastic Four Number 1, published as one of the first books from Time Lee's newly adopted company name, Marvel. The success of that book led to a whole new universe of characters being created, mostly by Stan Lee, with various artists including Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, Bill Everett, and others. In the early to mid-60s, when Marvel was just starting out, it was much easier to tell the difference between Marvel and DC books. Marvel books, almost exclusively written by Stan Lee, were very character-driven. DC's books were much more plot-driven. Also, while DC's books tended to focus primarily on the superheroes, Marvel's books were focused as much on the person behind the mask and their troubles as they were their heroic adventures. And you can see some remnants of that to this day. I think it's safe to say that DC's best-known heroes are Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. In all three cases, the character is more true to themselves when they are wearing the costume than when they are in civilian clothes. Superman will pretend to be klutzy, Batman acts like an apathetic trust fund brat, and Wonder Woman makes up an entirely new identity altogether to get away from her life as an Amazonian princess. In the current Wonder Woman run, she doesn't even bother having the Diana Prince identity. She's simply Wonder Woman all the time. Meanwhile, on the Marvel side, characters like Spider-Man, Daredevil, and Iron Man spent as much time out of costume worrying about things like their romantic entanglements and financial situations as they did in costume fighting the latest supervillain. Along those same lines, in general, DC's stories tend to be bigger than life, mythic adventures, compared to more grounded stories in the Marvel Universe. To give an example, Alex Ross painted award-winning stories for both companies back-to-back in the mid-90s. Kingdom Come, the DC book, was a massive biblical allegory where life on Earth is threatened by the war between various superhero factions. Marvel's book, simply titled Marvels, was a nostalgic look back at some of the major stories from the past seen through the eyes of a photographer-slash-reporter for the Daily Bugle. The story focused primarily on how his relationships were affected by the superheroic events, rather than the actual events themselves. So, the divide between Marvel and DC started almost as soon as there was a Marvel to compare to DC, and Stan Lee and the other Marvel creators helped egg this on. A popular advertising gimmick of the day was to compare your product to Brand X. And in the editorial and letters pages, Marvel would refer to DC as Brand Ech. They even put out a comic with frequent DC parodies that they called Not Brand Ech. Later, Stan would move to a more classy note by referring to DC as The Distinguished Competition. Distinguished Competition. D-C. Get it? Okay. But... The rift had already been formed at this point, and in those early days, the creators took sides just as much as the fans did. Writers and artists who worked for DC would not work for Marvel, and vice versa, with exceptions being incredibly rare for quite some time, even among freelancers. Now, as we move into the late 60s and beyond to the 70s, there was more cross-pollination between the two companies' creative teams, and the storytelling styles became more similar, though I would argue that DC took more from Marvel's tropes than the other way around. But by this time, the camps had been formed, 
there were Marvel fans and there were DC fans. Marvel fans thought DC books were too juvenile or simplistic, while DC fans thought Marvel books were too soap opery. And no matter how much the books started to look and feel more similar, the hardcore fans wouldn't hear it. That rivalry among the fan communities has stayed fairly constant over the years, but the relationship between the companies themselves has waxed and waned over time. For the most part, I would classify the DC-Marvel relationship as a friendly rivalry, with a few twists and turns along the way. Ironically, when Marvel first started publishing their superhero titles in the 60s, they were actually being distributed by DC. That's right, Timely slash Marvel had lost their distribution deal in 1957, so for a number of years, DC's parent company, Independent News, distributed Marvel's books as well as DC's. Because of that, Marvel was limited to eight ongoing titles per month until 1968, when they were able to make a distribution deal with a new company and expand their publishing roster. In the late 70s and early 80s, Marvel and DC co-published a number of crossovers together, including two Superman Spider-Man books, Batman vs. the Incredible Hulk, and X-Men Teen Titans. There were plans for a Justice League Avengers book, but that fell apart. A couple of years later, DC's publisher approached Marvel to license out all of the DC characters and have Marvel publish their adventures instead. This could have spelled the end of the DC-Marvel rivalry and created a near monopoly in the comic book market. Obviously, this did not end up happening, and just a decade later, Marvel declared bankruptcy, and rumors floated around that DC slash Warner Brothers might buy it up, which would have ended up with the same result, but with DC on top. Again, that was not how things resolved, but it's interesting to wonder, what if? There have been a couple of other occasions where DC and Marvel have worked together, most notably in the late 90s when we got a full Marvel vs. DC crossover and the Amalgam books, where characters from each universe were mashed together to make new characters, like Batman and Wolverine making Dark Claw, and Superman and Captain America becoming Super Soldier. A few years after that, the JLA Avengers crossover that was promised two decades earlier finally happened. But that was the last time the two companies worked together in any significant way. In the early days of social media, some of the higher-ups at both companies made comments about their crosstown rivals that left bitter tastes in the other's mouth. Since then, both sides have basically come out and said that until there's a regime change with the other company, it's unlikely that any future crossovers will occur. So, I've covered a good deal of the history between the companies and some of their differences. However, I don't think any of that has gotten to the real answer to the second part of Joshua's question, which is, why is it either or for so many? For that, I think we have to look at a basic component of human society called tribalism. Especially in cases where there are two strong forces, you'll often see people choosing sides, even though those, quote, choices have more in common with each other than they do differences. That tribalism is the same reason why you have Coke versus Pepsi, Star Trek versus Star Wars, Apple versus Microsoft, and a host of other rivalries. With other entertainment forms like movies, music, and TV, there are more than two sides, especially today. And while there are other comic book companies like Dark Horse, Image, and Valiant, to name just a few, Marvel and DC dominate the market so much that they're simply referred to as the big two in comic book related news stories. And everyone wants to have their team, so the rivalry goes on. Again, thanks for your question, Joshua. 
It was a lot of fun diving into the history between these two companies. I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you have something in the geek realm that you'd like to know more about, or you'd like to, well, actually, me about something I've said, please send me an email at welcome to geektown, all spelled out, at gmail.com. You can also leave a comment directly on the show notes at www.welcome to, the number two in this case, geektown.com. While you're there, be sure to check the Amazon links to some of the stories we've discussed. Other contact options include facebook.com slash welcome to geektown or twitter at geektown podcast. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe and give me a five-star review over on iTunes to join the Geektown City Council and to help other people find the show so we can all tell them, welcome to Geektown, population, us. Welcome to Geek Town is written, narrated, edited, and produced by me, Kurt Onstead. Theme music is by Aaron Levitz, logo art by Archie Santana. All other sound clips are the copyrighted material of their respective owners, and no infringement is intended, falling under fair use.